The countdown is on. Everything you need to get the edge at the end of the market day. This is The Close. A big bet in the futures market that says a Fed cut isn't as far into the future as some folks think. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. Will we get a 30-second record close? Uh, well, we're going to find out in so about close. one hour's time. Yeah. I know. We're just down by like one tenth. It could happen. All right, let's get a check here on where market stands. So the S&P is just down two tenths of one percent off its lows, clearly trying to make a run uh, into, into uh, neutral territory before the close. We'll see what the next 60 minutes bring. But it's really about the tech giants. Remain, we'll get to that more in just a moment. But you got the Nasdaq 100 uh, selling off. NVIDIA responsible for about 48 points from uh, Nasdaq 100. Uh, Ten-year yield also minor selling off here with yields up just a touch by about two basis points remain. Yeah, one reason why we're seeing some softness out there is that the underpinnings for what had effectively been an eight-week rally here for U.S. stocks starting to show some strain amid fresh economic data that shows the number of people continuously receiving unemployment benefits. That was up for a seventh straight week. And then you had a separate report out there showing U.S. home construction slumping to its slowest pace since the pandemic. More evidence out there, at least for all the haters, the higher for longer rates are indeed taking their toll on this market. It's a sentiment shared to some extent by C-suite executives with a new survey of CFOs out showing monetary policy, inflation, and the labor market all remaining their top worries. In fact, almost one third of the CFOs in that survey saying that they are delaying, scaling down, or permanently canceling investments due to economic and political uncertainties. Is that an overreaction? Maybe. But this was one of the fears for equity bulls who had been riding that wave of seemingly endless record highs after record highs, record highs that were increasingly showing ever narrowing participation. Coming into today, a third of the S&P members were at four-week lows, while barely 3% of the index was at one-month highs. You know, things have narrowed out there. So it has been a good environment uh, the last couple of years, despite high rates. Um, and of course, the U.S. is a shining star in the world in terms of economic growth. Um, but when you look at the market dynamics, it is pretty narrow. Yeah, it certainly has narrowed, Alex, and that really is a lot of uh, a lot of the disappointment right now. And sort of what breaks us out of that? Is it going to be earnings? Is it going to be economic fundamentals? Or is it going to be Jay Powell and the Fed? Yep. Or just time? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So here's something interesting, and this sort of ties together uh, the data that we've got. And this is uh, the white line is a city uh, U.S. economic surprise index. So just a quick tutorial. If it's in positive territory, it means we're surprising data to the upside. Negative territory means we're surprising to the downside. And the purple line here is the S&P. And as you can see, you know, as you have economic surprises to the upside, you wind up having equities having a nice move higher. The divergence starts, though, in the beginning of May. S&P obviously grinding higher, while the uh, U.S. economic surprise index now now is its lowest level uh, since 2022. That's quite a gap. So, I mean, how does that wind up resolving itself? Are we going to be in a situation where we get negative surprise after negative surprise? And what's the effect on the markets as we kick you off to the close here on this Thursday afternoon? Let's get right to it with Stuart Paul over at Bloomberg Economics joining us right now on the back of two interesting economic reports that we got this morning. I don't know how significant they're going to be. We have weakless jobless claims, which you know are always erratic, but we're continuing to see those continuing claims go higher. Then you had housing data, also somewhat erratic, but still showing a trend line that seems to suggest softness there. Pick one. Which What's most important? I think that it's probably yeah. weakness in housing starts that mm -hmm. matters most. We're seeing, as you mentioned, uh, monetary policy gaining quite a bit of traction in the real economy. Housing starts declining to the downside, declining about 5.5% month on month, and permits continue sliding. A big part of the reason for that is because the stock of new homes that are available for sale and just not transacting is pretty high. It's near early 2008 levels. So you should expect to see some headwinds for construction activity as new home inventories continue building. At the end of the day, though, is it just about jobs? As long as the jobs market is okay, we can weather the rest despite the weak housing number? I think that's the case, but we are seeing softening in the labor market. We are seeing continuing claims continue to rise. We are seeing that applying upward pressure to the unemployment rate breaching or hitting that 4% mark matters a lot. And we think that 42 to 4.3% is within reach for the September FOMC meeting. And that could be a deciding factor in determining whether we get two cuts this year or just one as the FOMC was showing in its previous dot plot. 
All right, Stuart Paul over at Bloomberg Economics. A nice wrap up here of a couple of the big economic data points and I guess the reaction function, potential reaction function by the Fed and the markets. Let's continue this conversation right now with Rob Arnott, founder and chairman of Research Affiliates. Rob, uh, thanks for being here on the program. Let's start with the macro and the fundamentals uh, for just a moment here before we get into some of the individual market moves. I, I am curious that when you think about how the market has sort of assessed these economic data points and their assumption that at some point this is going to push the Fed to cut. Do you think that's realistic? Well, yeah, uh, the Fed at some stage is likely to cut. Uh, uh, the macroeconomic uh, outlook is is kind of mixed. It's, it's interesting. If you look at PMI, Purchasing Managers Index, it's in the worst quartile historically. If you look at inventories, they're in the highest quartile ever. If you look at the slope of the yield curve, which is a terrific predictor of slowdowns, uh, it's in its worst decile ever. If you look at rate of change of the cost of capital, which is uh, a gauge that helps us understand wh whether companies are going to invest in new initiatives, uh, that's in its worst decile ever. So with four out of four looking troubled, um, why is this economy chugging ahead? It's all on the back of a wealth effect from a bull market mm -hmm. plus consumer spending. And so my question is, will those four indicators of slowdown have time to turn before consumer spending slows uh, or before the market uh, rolls over? Let me, let me, and uh, the jury's out on that. I don't know. Well, let me flip that on its head, though. Do you think the Fed Will I get be able to turn fast enough to maybe avert that, or are we kind of past that Rubicon already? Uh, we often hear that um, monetary policy has long and variable lags. Um, what is what does that mean? That means that the impact of monetary policy on the macro economy is slow, and we don't know how slow. It can take a year. It can take two years. Um, when you say slow and variable lags, another way to interpret that is maybe there's no impact anyway. Well, that's what so, I was going to say. No, Rob, that's what I was going to ask. 25 basis point cut. What does that actually do? It's not clear to me it does anything other than uh, uh, perk up enthusiasm, uh, uh, create a little bit of liquidity that often makes its way into the markets. And uh, I, I don't think the Fed has the power to stimulate the economy. I think the Fed has power to, to stimulate bubbles, mm -hmm. but not to stimulate the economy. So is the Fed going to cut rates? I, I think they urgently want to cut rates, want to cut rates as soon as they have the economic cover to do so. A softening economy may give them cover to do so uh, sooner rather than later. But... Um, if if inflation surges back, which seems very possible, uh, uh, the uh, commodities indexes are uh, have soared in the last six months. Uh, if inflation does reignite, then they can't cut. If um, the economy remains robust, then they can't cut. So uh, they want to cut. Yeah. But they're just not being given cover to do so. Rob, do you do you feel like there could be an uh, an offside risk that there's a hike in our future? Absolutely. Um, I would characterize the current outlook as uh, not quite symmetric, more likely to see cuts than increases. But, you know, if inflation does come roaring back, uh, the, between now and year end, we are replacing months that were very benign last year. Uh, every month, we wait with bated breath for the new inflation report. And uh, the new inflation report exactly equals last month's inflation report plus one new month minus one old month. Now, that plus one new month, we don't know what it's going to look like. The minus one old month, we know exactly what it was. And if it was low, abnormally low inflation during the latter months of last year, then upward pressure is more likely uh, um, uh, upward pressure on inflation is more likely than downward. So we're of the view that uh, three and a half to five is the likely end of year inflation number. Mm -hmm. Three and a half is not going to 
bother anyone. Four to five yeah. is going to be seen as a real blow and would keep the Fed from cutting and might encourage them to hike again. All right, Rob, we're just getting started here. I'll sit tight. We're in conversation right now with Rob Arnott over at Research Affiliates. We need to take a break, but he's sticking with us. And when we come back, we're going to take a look at what has effectively been an eight-month-long rally, a rally that started narrow, had really broadened out, but now has gotten narrow once again. And today, taking a breather, his thoughts on market breath after the break on The Close on Bloomberg. All right, tech takes a little bit of a break today. You got Apple, Nvidia leading losses today in those mega caps. Rob Arnott is research affiliates is still with us. Um, hey, Rob, is the money going to come out of tech and go into value and go into those areas, or is it just going to come out of the index altogether? Well, it doesn't come out of anything because there's a buyer for every seller. Uh, what moves the price is more desire to sell, so that um, if if the appetite for buying diminishes and the appetite for selling increases, the price falls. So it's not actually that money p comes out per se. Mm -hmm. um, markets move based on expectations and capital flows. Capital flows have been robust. That's been helping fuel a bull market. Um, but back to your original question, value is cheap. Value reached all-time record cheapness in uh, August of 2020, mm -hmm. re measured relative to growth, in each case measured relative to the underlying fundamentals. What's the relative price earnings ratio, price to book value ratio, price to sales, and so forth. All time record cheapness for value relative to growth in 2020, even cheaper than at the top of the dot com bubble in 2000. We're getting back down to those levels. Value is approximately one eighth as expensive as growth. That's an enormous spread. Mm -hmm. Normal is about a fourth. Value would have to literally double relative to growth just to get back to historic norms. So value is cheap. Then the question is, what's the catalyst that could move us back to that? An inflation shock could certainly uh, do that. An economic shock could do that. Anything that increases investors' desire for a margin of safety mm -hmm. will have them moving money into um, value. So I think value is the place to go, and I think non-U.S. equities are a lot cheaper than U.S. equities. Ah. Uh, the narrative so, is is they're cheaper for a reason. Their growth rates are lousy, and that's true, but it's in the price. But is it? Because, because of, uh, but I feel like European stocks, for example, have had their moment a bunch of times where like they're so cheap you just have to go and buy them and it still hasn't worked out on a sustained basis. In fact, this time it feels like flows are coming into the U.S. from Europe because of political risk. Of course they are. Of course flows are. Um, unless you want to chase performance, um, uh, past performance, you don't go where the flows have gone. You go where the fl flows are going to go. Now, nobody knows where they are going to go, but uh, it does make sense to ask the question, what's cheap, and is there an objective reason it should be this cheap? Uh, U.S. is priced at about a 70% premium, looking at conventional valuation multiples, about a 70% premium to uh, broad international stocks yeah. and about a 90% premium to Europe and about a 120% premium to emerging markets. Are emerging markets really going to perform so badly as economies that they deserve a fair price that's less than half the U.S.? Yeah. Um, back in 2008, they were priced at a premium. They were. And I, I do want to circle back, though, to a, oh, just one word to knit it. And you said you used the word conventional valuation metrics. And I bring that up. I mean, we were talking with some folks a couple of weeks ago about kind of the need or the necessity that some folks feel that we need to kind of break away from some of those conventional valuation metrics, that we need something new to reflect new times. You've done that to some extent at Research Affiliates, although We've I know you're still... That, yes. Yeah, well, talk a little bit about that, because that's easier said than done. Firstly, um, no, uh, when you're investing in companies, you're not investing in a bunch of statistical attributes. <laughs> you're, you're investing in a business that has people, products, um, business strategies, and so forth. So the numbers are actually just a shorthand for all of that. Um, but if you look at price-to-sales ratio, it's a wonderful indicator of what's cheap and what's not. 
<clears throat> but it ignores debt and mm. companies heavily burdened with debt uh, the price to sales ratio ought to be adjusted to take that into account uh, if you're looking at um, uh, price earnings ratios um, uh, you're um, uh, usually it's price to forward earnings but forward earnings haven't happened yet mm -hmm. if you're looking at price to book you're ignoring intangibles and we're in a, an economy where over half of the value of a business goes up and down in the elevator every day yeah and that's the intangible so if you can get measures of intangibles you can make price to book a much more powerful measure that's where a lot of our research has gone yeah. if you look at stock buybacks they're a big part of the way companies reward their shareholders right dividends plus buybacks are a powerful metric so putting all of this together you can make better valuation multiple measures but no matter what measures you use mm -hmm. Value is about twice as cheap relative to growth as historic norms, and yeah. moving back towards historic norms would require value to roughly double relative to growth. Uh, that is very cheap. This is a time to yeah. average in to larger value allocations, not to run away. All right, well said, uh, Rob. I got to leave it there. We'll pick up this conversation pretty soon, I'm sure. Rob Arnott over at Research Affiliates helping us kick you off to the close here on this Thursday afternoon. Coming up in just a second, a look at some of the big movers on the day. That includes Nike shares actually moving higher despite the fact that Williams Trading cutting its price target on the sportswear company. We're going to talk to the analyst behind that call. All right, plus Elon Musk says in a post on X that Dell and Supermicro Computer will provide server racks for his new AI startup. We're going to take a closer look in our stock of the hour. And McDonald's aiming to fight its competitors with lower prices. We're going to tell you what a $5 bill will get you at the Golden Arches. That's coming up next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Time now for our top calls. A look at some of the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And let's start off with Skyworks Solutions. B. Riley lifting its price target on the semiconductor stock to a street high, $130 a share from 96. It's the first time in more than two years that the firm has turned positive on the Apple supplier and its ability to generate sales, profit, and upside from AI data centers. Nevertheless, the share is fractionally lower here on the day. Next up, let's take a look at SolarEdge. A price target cut to $59 from $73 over at JP Morgan. The analyst saying residential solar demand in Europe, where SolarEdge gets more than half its sales, it's practically in a state of death. He's also cautious about near-term uncertainty related to elections and policy changes, though he is keeping his overweight rating, at least for now. Those shares down 7% here on the day. Now let's end things on Nike. The big swoosh getting a big bear hug over at Williams Trading, cutting its price target down to 75 from 81. The analyst there, Sam Poser, not feeling confident in Nike C-suite and says it may have shot itself in the foot with too many layoffs. He also says that the lack of talent has led to push model manufacturing and increased promotional activity. Nike shares, which had been lower on the day, up about 1% here, though. It's, of course, one of the bigger laggards in the retail space on a year-to-date basis, and those are some of our top calls. And we want to stick with that last one there because it is a bull call, and I'm pleased to say the analyst behind it joining us right now. Sam Poser is senior equity analyst covering footwear and apparel over at Williams trading. Uh, Sam, th this call isn't completely out of the blue. I can just tell you from a consumer perspective, I noticed a lot more promotional offers in my email box from Nike, offers that I wasn't getting two years ago. I've also noticed that when I go to shop on their site, it's the same old, same old stuff here. Is this the reason why we've seen kind of that sour sentiment around this stock? I think so. And I, and I think the controversy with the stock, however, is involved in what they've done. They've come out of things in the past, which we don't see happening today i mean you know we don't think that the company has the same uh mojo at, at today that it had um you know yeah. let's say between 15 and 17 when they went through some uh some softness and uh most recent past well what what do you think would actually get them there though because i mean i, I feel that to a certain extent with these apparel brands it, it's all kind of cyclical, you know, one, one is up one year. Now you walk through the streets of New York, everybody's wearing uh, Adidas Sambas for some strange reason. And next year they'll be wearing something else here. I mean, what can Nike do to sort of get themselves out of this rut? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, I, I think that trends 
evolved for a reason. I mean, if you look at, let's say, the Air Force One from Nike, it's been a very, very good shoe for a long time, or or the Dunks. But now they have to pull back on the Dunks because I believe what happened was they were selling through very quickly some new people, uh, let's say analysts within Nike, looked at it and said, well, the way this is selling, we could sell a lot more. Then they put a lot more in, and then all of a sudden they put in a little more than what the demand is, and all of a sudden you get say, you get markdowns and you get, you know, you get a problem. Uh, if they had kept it tight, we may not be. They need to. They need to still have more uh, product evolution. But if they had kept it tight, we would be not seeing as many problems. So Sam, how it's, much of it though do you think is a macro issue in general? Like if consumers are stretched, they're not going to go to Nike, for example, they'll go somewhere else. Versus they're just not coming up with the best product at the right time. Well, I think I think that the macro is an equal opportunity annoyance in a good times and bad and there's and and if you look at it you mentioned the samba but we can also talk about hokas ons we can talk about asics uh uh a lot of the asics and brooks and um and new balance shoes that are doing exceptionally well so i think it's this is all on nike this is not anything to do with macro um what's, uh, what I mean, about talent like what kind of talent bank can they get well, that's that's a bigger issue. I mean, they lost they they let go of a lot of senior people over the last few years. And and those were people that really understood how the company worked. And you're dealing with, you know, the largest, you know, one of the largest sportswear company in the world. And when you get rid of all that institutional knowledge, it it um, it, it isn't a good thing. And uh, and so. You know, we think just a lot of decisions are being made for the wrong reasons. Um, I heard from one retailer that, you know, is getting higher allocations of product and he seems happy about it, but he knows uh, it could bite him if, uh, if, that, if it doesn't work. And, um, you know, so on paper, he's happy he's getting more, but, but from what we're seeing, you know, about what's selling, uh, you know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if he, he doesn't even know if he should have as much optimism as he does. Hey, Sam, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. It was a fun conversation. Sam Poser over at Williams uh, Trading. We appreciate your time today. You guys are really up on your lingo, your sneaker lingo. The sneaker lingo? I, I, uh, I have no game. Yeah. I have no sneaker lingo game. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, but that's a good to the, the other thing, too. I mean, you have to be in the zeitgeist, right, if you're going to sell these shoes or at least get people to continue selling these shoes. And I have to say, Nike, I feel like it's just they got in this rut. It was like they're just selling the pandas and the dunks and all that. And then, you know, kids move on. And let's face it, they're the ones kind of driving this. It's not, you know, those older people. You know, we're... You know, I wear the Please. same. This guy has really uh, good shoes. Let's I, not even yeah. pretend. You yeah, know they're not Nike. Closet. Asics, so that was a new one to me. Did you yeah. know Asics were back? Uh, yeah, I used to run in them, but not anymore. Anyway, there you go. All right, coming up, we're going to get more uh, insight into the credit market with Mark Okada, co-founder and CEO of Sycamore Tree Capital Markets. This is Bloomberg. It'll probably take a year or two to get all the way back down to our 2% target. The good news in all of this is that the labor market has remained remarkably strong. Wage growth is still pretty good for workers. Uh, by some measures, might be still a little bit too high uh, to get back to our 2% inflation target. So getting all the way back to 2% is going to take a little more time, but I'm confident that we're going to get there. That was Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Bostic, and I think that's Alex Steele. I am. I'm Alex Steele. Uh, so the, the, the Kashkari kind of continues to double down. Obviously, he's been front and center in that, in that, like, we're higher for longer, higher for longer, yeah. higher for longer. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's been a bit on a repeat. But we should also point out, mostly the other Fed members seem to be saying the same thing, seeing some of the same hymnal. So I don't know if you take that as a positive sign that they're all on the same page, or you get worried that, well, they're not going to cut anytime soon. Or at least preaching yeah. patience and data dependence. And our next guest says that higher for longer, he's been saying it for a while, will lead to a significant increase in Treasury auction sizes this year. He expects a 23% increase on average across the yield curve. So joining us now, Mark Okada, co-founder and CEO of Sycamore Tree Capital Partners. Mark, such a pleasure. So higher for longer, you've been saying it, you've been proven right. That's what are right. the opportunities? What are the risks associated with that? Well, there's always both, right? So we'll start with opportunities. I, th I think what's happened in this higher for longer environment, coupled with a massive increase in liquidity across markets, I mean, there, there, is, there is certainly, as, as we look out and look at deal flow 
just markets in general, there's a lot of liquidity that's sloshing around out there. So when you have the combination of very nice high rates and a lot of liquidity, the liquid parts of the market, the public parts of the market versus the private parts of the market look very good to us right now. I mean, that, that, that opportunity of, uh, of private debt versus public debt, private equity versus public equity, the, the tables have turned a lot. Wait, I thought everyone loved private credit. I thought that was the jam. Like, the, the, that was the new FOMO. It is. It, 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 it is. It has been. And, and it has doubled in size in the last couple years, which always is a warning sign for credit people. You know, we look at that, we go, wait a second. <laughs> um, but, but I think the, the, the dynamics of locking up your money for a long period of time is good when you, have, you want to avoid volatility, but it's not so good when you want to take advantage of volatility. And that volatility I'm talking about is what's happening with interest rates. So if, if for example, right, you, you're in the bank loan index, public market, very large, very liquid, earning nine and a half, ten percent 10%. That's around the 80th, 90th percentile as far as yield, overall yield. Like retirees don't eat spread, they yield, right? So yield at that sort of rate, that's great. Mm -hmm. I can get that in a public market with transparency and liquidity. If I don't like it, I can sell it. Yeah. Or I can get stuck in a private debt fund and lock up my money for the next five, 10 years. But is that going to change, though? I mean, let's face it. I mean, one of the reasons why we saw all that money go into private credit was because the yield was there, at least before interest rates went up to 5%. So, I mean, the differential between what you can get in private markets versus in public markets was enormous. And right. now, I know that gap is narrowed, yes. but you have a lot of people betting that rates are going to come down. Does that change the dynamic? Well, again, it's, yeah. it's, it, in the backdrop, if you believe in higher for longer, which we do, mm -hmm. um, and I, I really... What does longer mean, though? Three, four, five years? I mean, I, yeah. I, I definitely think this is more of the normal environment versus mm -hmm. what we had before. A lot of the private equity and private debt was put on because of the zero interest rate world that we lived in. And in that scenario, it makes gobs of sense. It makes tons of sense. Mm -hmm. But in the world we're in now, where rates are higher permanently, you know, we're, we're, so let's say rates come down and we're, we go from five and a half to three and a half, mm -hmm. where do you think the 10 year is going to be? It's not going back down to two. It's, you know, could that, could, could that normalize at five? Sure, yeah. that could happen. Mm -hmm. Th those were all environments where what we're doing in, in liquid public markets would be quite attractive. When you, when you look at the money that's already in some of these uh, private credit yes. and private equity vehicles, now mon money for a lot of folks that's locked in and yep. potentially for a significant amount of time here, and you talk about the opportunity costs that they miss, uh, what sort of, I guess, gets them back on board, I guess, whenever their vintages come due and yeah. assuming they actually get paid when they come due? <laughs> which, which, I mean, you laugh, but, you know, well, I, I, what, what, some, some of you guys are sweeping a little stuff under the rug here. Well, yeah. and, 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 yeah. and as long as it's yeah. working, as long as the returns are yeah. there, that's not really, it's been, it's yeah. been a great, I'm yeah. not saying it's been a bad allocation or it's mm -hmm. been a bad um, uh, risk-adjusted return. What I'm saying is that relative to what we're doing, it's not so great. So the way you have to do that, if you are an allocator or a pension fund and you're in these allocations, you have to look to secondaries. Yeah. Or you, you have to lever the fund to find the liquidity to do that. You gotta sell something, because mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're fully invested, so, or some have cash. But, but, I, but I'm just saying, from a relative basis, this mega trend of from private to public, I think it's durable. I think it's something that, that you know, we will see much more of going forward. Mm -hmm. A lot of the PE guys now are focused on secondaries, because yes, people yeah. want to get out of their exposures. Yeah. And that's an interesting uh, dynamic. That's, that's yeah. going to be something that's going to be much more um, durable as a return uh, um, stream. But, but really, it, it, that's more private equity and venture and places that people, they're not getting any realizations so mm -hmm. they want to get out. Yeah. But I'm thinking it's going to start coming in private debt too. Yeah. Um, so that, that's kind of the call. So that's sort of where the opportunity then may lie, right? But what about the risks? Sure. Um, I mean, with higher for longer, like yeah. what gets hurt? What are you most worried about? Well, it's 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 always two things. Mm -hmm. When we're we're nervous, we're credit people, so we're always you nervous. Be nervous for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've been bullish, which is weird for for credit <laughs> people to be bullish. But but to be to be the things to be worried about are always credit risk fundamentals. The U.S. economy looks pretty good, and it looks like it's it's, it's in a period where. The, yeah, there's plenty to worry about. Most of those risks were above ground. We, we, we know about Ukraine. We know about the, the, uh, the politics that we're facing. We know about the, the deficit. Um, and, and 
even with all of that, we've got a pretty good corporate economy. It looks pretty yeah. good. And, and it's well, and it, better than the regular economy. Or the, the, yeah. yeah, which yeah. is a great. Which, which is which good you, for the stock which, market. And it's yeah. to us. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think from, from an opportunity set, that's going to be supportive of credit. And it's going to be con supportive of, of yield. And it's going to be supportive of, of taking a little more risk, corporate risk, in your portfolio. So that's, that's all good. The risks that we see are obviously what's happened with covenants and what's happening with, with the way these cap circles are built and what's happening with all this liability management exercise that we talk yeah. about, it's not been good. I mean, if, if you look at the defaults that we've had, mm -hmm. the recoveries have been low because of all the shenanigans and, and the, a good um, active manager who knows what they're doing is going to avoid that stuff. That's, you know, knock on wood, let's hope we can do that. But you get stuck in that stuff, that's a risk. That, that's definitely a risk, and it's out there, and, and you've got to do your homework, and you can't get complacent about the risk. Before we let you go, there's another risk, which is uh, we've been waiting for the wall of Treasury issuance to yeah. hit investors and for them to kind of flee and have that Liz Trust moment, right, where they push back against how much government spending. Yeah. Is that a risk? Oh, totally. Uh, but, but I don't know what but to do. But when is it a risk? Uh, like, when do you feel it as an investor? Um, <laughs> When, when, when we pass the point where interest costs uh, are bigger than the military budget, and you know, yeah. you know, we're in this place where it's 700 and something billion a day in interest expense. I yeah. mean, it, these are crazy numbers. One of the things I was looking at is if you look at the average maturity of treasury debt, mm -hmm. and you look back five years, and you look back now, it's about the same. Oh. So. Our Treasury Secretaries Mnuchin and Yellen did nothing to avoid this massive. They knew rates were going higher. Oh yeah. They could have issued longer bonds and they extended could have. the debt. Oh yeah. And so here we have ourselves where oh, yeah. where the cost of debt is rising dramatically yeah. for us. Yeah. Yellen's funding most of the government in T bills, which is the most expensive yes. part of the curve. Yeah. yeah preach. And yeah. <laughs> and so that that is definitely yeah. something where the rubber is going to meet the road at some point here. Yeah, and the bill's going to come due, and yeah. and and I think the the yeah. thing I'm well, the only reason why we're comfortable is because the American exceptionalism yeah. continues. So let's hope it it does continue from here. Because right. if it doesn't, we have a Liz Truss moment. Uh, that would be horrible. Let's okay. say yeah. Okay, so. I'm going to ignore the last part of your comment. We're okay. going to end on the American exceptionalism. <laughs> to end on a high note. But Mark, great to talk to you. We'll talk again soon. Mark Akata, there, co-founder and CEO of Sycamore Tree Capital. Partners. Now, while he was speaking, there was some breaking news involving Penn Entertainment. The shares were halted. They have reopened, and they are surging. Boyd Gaming said to be expressing interest in buying Penn Entertainment. This is according to a report by Reuters, citing people familiar with the matter here. Right now, Reuters is saying that the valuation would put it at around $9 billion, including debt. Uh, Bloomberg has reached out to Boyd for comment, and we have not gotten it yet. We'll stay on top of this story here. Stick with us. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, welcome back. It's time now for our stock of the hour. Keeping an eye on shares of Dell and Supermicro. The shares had been up more than 9% here on the day, at least for Dell, about 10% on Supermicro. The shares now making a little bit of a U-turn. This after CEO Michael Dell teased an AI factory with NVIDIA to power the supercomputer for Elon Musk. AI startup. Abigail Doolittle joining us now uh, to talk a little bit more about this. And uh, Abigail, I, I do want to start off with the rally that we saw early in the shares of both Dell and Supermicro. This all stemmed uh, from an uh, post from Elon Musk where he suggested that, uh, that SMCI and Dell were going to help be supplying these racks. We then heard from Michael Dell himself seeming to confirm that here. And the shares got a nice pop out of it. Yeah, a huge yeah. pop. I mean, that was the big story this morning. Uh, and of course, it's the AI play, everything right now, the AI craze. But now we've had this reverse and that's a pretty significant reversal mm -hmm. from being up 9% to being down slightly. Now, I think that some of it is perhaps it was priced in because the fact that XAI is doing these server racks, uh, that's not an entire surprise uh, to us, Dell and Supermicrocomputer, that is new news. But if you think about it, and this is actually why I love technical analysis, this could be a piece we of the We all love technical analysis. We do. I'm yeah. glad to be spreading the message. Yeah. Um, but that people, other people down in Texas and California knew that this was coming. And so if you assume that everybody's buying with the information they know that's trickling in. So now this could be a classic sell 
the news Sell moment. The news, and yeah. then when you combine it with some of the other stocks selling off, such as NVIDIA, I mean, we've just had such a hype around AI. I mean, this morning, yeah. uh, NVIDIA was the world's most valuable company, uh, up 180%. Are they still the most valuable company I, now? No, I want to look into that. Yeah. I've been meaning to do that These all day. These things matter, actually. Abigail Doolittle. They, they're switching yeah. around ever so slightly above $3 trillion. It is definitely yeah. the $3 trillion club. Uh, some consolidation there is certainly helpful, but it this AI theme, at some point, yeah. is going to reverse significantly. This, I think, is yes. more of a gentle pause. It, it also feels like, oh, now we know it can also go down. Yes. So that, I mean, like, we, no, uh, literally, like, that's yeah, something, yeah, right? Yes, <laughs> for sure. And we've, we have seen that before. We have seen these, uh, you know, NVIDIA go down. Uh, in fact, between March, I'm going to pull up the chart very quickly, between March and, uh, here, here it is. So between uh, February, March, and then into April, the stock had actually been down, I think, almost 20%. Yeah. But then to your point, actually more than 20%, to your point, Alex, out of that April low to the recent high, up 86%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to be down right now 2 0.6% on the day. There's been a 9% intraday reversal or intraday moves. Yeah. That's healthy. It's, you know, putting some yeah. um, some heft into the that move up. Yeah, absolutely. Here, uh, Abigail do a little a nice look here at our stocks of the hour. A closer look at Dell, Supermicro, as well as NVIDIA and the entire AI ecosystem. As we count you down to the closing bells, just about 14 minutes to go. Kara Murphy on deck, Kestra Investment As Asset Management. That's coming up next on The Close on Bloomberg. Value is cheap. Value reached all-time record cheapness in uh, August of 2020, mm -hmm. re measured relative to growth. So I think value is the place to go, and I think non-U.S. equities are a lot cheaper than U.S. equities. Ah. Uh, the narrative so is is they're cheaper for a reason. Their growth rates are lousy, and that's true. All right, value may be cheap, but the big question is where do you actually find that value? Rob Arnott kicking things off to the close just a little bit a while ago. Romain Bostic here alongside Alex Steele with 10 minutes until we get to those bells. And maybe there is that search for value going on today here, particularly with the sell-off we're seeing in tech. But some of the buying we're seeing in some of the cyclical names and industrial names. Yep, look at that. It's almost like one for one at that point. Energy up almost 2%, but Infotech uh, down by one and a half. Interesting, right? I did also want to, you see the Gilead news? That was fascinating. I mean, talk about like a biotech stock that really has some uh, some juice there. That uh, basically we're looking at, you know, zero, 100% uh, protection against HIV. That's amazing. I thought that was incredible. Yeah, it's a nice pop in the stock yeah, there. Up about best performing stock in the s here as we move closer to those closing bells. Some bright spots out there if you look for them. Let's get some insights out of our next guest, Kara Murphy. She's going to help take us to those closing bells. Chief Investment Officer over at Kestra Investment Management. All right, Kara, you came on a good day here because that big monster rally we've had, I, let's just say it's on pause for today. Maybe tomorrow we'll, this, this whole conversation will be moot. But there's been a lot of talk here about how that rally had really started to narrow. Whether we were going to get a broadening of that rally or whether the rally was just going to come to an end on its own. Do you see more life in it? So this is yeah. a very challenging market rally to kind of chase, mm -hmm. right? Because it's really being driven by just a handful of names. And we saw glimmers of that broadening out, which I think is very healthy long term for the market. But one of the reasons why we're not super concerned about the concentration of the market is simply because it's been so supported by really strong earnings. Mm -hmm. If you look at the top 10 names in the S&P 500 and you track their earnings contribution and their market cap contribution, the S&P 500, it's basically been in lockstep. Yeah. So what that tells you is that there's a lot of fundamental underpinning for it. Well, I'm just going to play devil's advocate for a second because the earnings have been phenomenal and certainly a surprise for a lot of investors. But if you take out, say, some of the top 15, 20 best performers that we've had, you're looking at S&P that's pretty, internal, on an earnings basis, that's still somewhat shaky. Yeah, and I think that's one of the challenges. You know, your previous guest was talking about growth versus value, huge discount for value right now. Absolutely true, and I think that does present a long-term opportunity, but growth has increased 20% earnings over the last couple of quarters while value has been negative. Mm -hmm. So at some point, that will start to shift, and I think into next year, we start to see more earnings power in some of these more cyclical companies, but so far, it's just not coming through. So it's not like a sell tech by energy. Like, it's nothing that simple. <laughs> I wish it were, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to so boil nice. it down for us here. <laughs> no, that's not it. So energy, we think uh, we actually had exposure earlier this year partly as an inflation hedge. 
But we think now inflation is going to continue to subside on a slow pace. But we think the reason for being really overweight energy is a little bit less today than it was. So no, we don't think it's that simple. Get out of uh, get out of tech into energy. But what you do need to do is if you have a portfolio that looks a lot like a core benchmark, understand that you are very heavily invested in growth and mega, tap, yeah. mega cap. You are much less diversified than you were a couple of years ago, and that's important to understand. You need to go elsewhere for diversification. Can, can I just ask, this might be a dumb question, but if you do believe that inflation is coming down, does that get factored in to how you value some of these companies? Because I'm just trying to make sense of why we continue to see these pops up for companies that have already had phenomenal runs. Is that a big factor? So it's not a dumb question okay. at all. And I think it's really yeah. interesting because typically in a very high inflation environment, higher valued stocks are gonna get punished more, right? Because you have to discount those future earnings. We didn't see that over the last couple of years. Instead, everyone piled into tech where valuations are higher. So I don't think, I, generally speaking, yes, that would be a concerning sign, yeah. but it hasn't worked that way in the last couple of years. Yeah. What other sort of derivative tech plays? Like if you didn't, if you wanted to be aware that like the MAG7, you're heavily invested if you're in an index fund or something, how do you offset that? So it, 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 it doesn't have to get that complicated. You want to build in a little bit more exposure to value, a little bit more exposure to the mid cap. We think mid cap in particular is a really nice fishing ground. Passive investors have kind of left it behind. And so there are a lot of really interesting opportunities. And then in fixed income, there are also opportunities to diversify as well. We're in fixed income. So, you know, your, another previous guest was talking about concerns within the Treasury market. We have concerns in the long end of the Treasury market for exactly those reasons of increasing mm. government debt. So we would look for other areas within credit. And also active management is typically a really good place to be at oh. these crossroads. So I love that comment because then I get to play devil's advocate again. <laughs> so I try to do this at home, but my wife kind of shuts it down. But I, I am curious, like, everyone's talking about the debt levels. And, I, and look, I know historically, on a percentage of basis, they're astronomical relative to pretty much everything yeah. in the world here. But why am I supposed to think that it's going to matter this time around? Because I heard the same narrative, I don't know, 20-something years ago when we were kind of reaching 3% 100%. levels. Now I know we're approaching 6% levels or something around that nature here. Is it really going to have an impact? Or you so, think it's so, so the reason yeah. why today is different relative yeah. to over the last 20 years, because I've gotten this question for many years. My answer was always, it doesn't matter the American government can borrow with impunity. Mm -hmm. But during that time, just over the last couple of years, what you've seen is the debt burden, right? As interest rates have gone up, the cost of servicing that debt has really soared. And that's the big difference. A couple of years ago, we had the lowest debt cost that we've had since the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And if you just project on out, same growth in, the, in debt, same growth, or, or at same um, interest rates, it becomes really hard to manage. And it's also very, very difficult to bring down. And I don't care what party you're in, yeah. nobody's gonna have an easy time bringing that down. Well, we had Mark Ocado on just a little while ago over at Sycamore, he kind of talked about the same thing, the servicing, debt servicing costs, and how, I guess, to a certain extent, I guess that effectively kind of steals money from other potential projects. And we know that a big part of the rally that we've had uh, recently has been partly due to fiscal spending and the fiscal stimulus. Yeah, and I think yeah. infrastructure is a great example, right? Where that's an area we know has been underinvested in for decades. The government has suddenly made it a priority, put dollars behind it, yeah. and it's been an important driver of construction spending around the country. So those dollars really do matter. And if you have to spend them in debt markets instead of in those projects, somebody's gonna suffer. Yeah. Where in an infrastructure do you like? Um, I think broadly, like when we look at const um, construction manufacturing, it is up by astronomical amounts over the last two to three years. We have not seen a splurge like this in so long. So you can find it in cement suppliers, in engineering companies, Love you know, it. all along the food chain. I think there are a lot of opportunities. All right, Kara, great stuff. Always Thank great you. to talk to you. Kara Murphy right here in Studio 2, Kestra Investment Management, helping us count down to the closing bells. Just about three minutes to go until we get there. Alex, stocks pretty much hovering where they've been now for roughly the last hour. The S&P uh, down about three-tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq down almost a full percentage point. But transports up more than a percent. Dow Industrials up seven-tenths of a percent. It's really hard, though, to get a, a good fundamental read today. I know We have witching tomorrow, so we have a lot of options expiring. Quad mm -hmm. witching, right? We have the rebalancing. What's well, triple witching? They got rid of that fourth witch. They did, right. She, she okay, was but trouble. There's lots, yeah. of, there's lots of witching involved yeah. here tomorrow, but the idea is it's going to be a liquidity event, potentially, and yeah. it's going to be hard, I think, to get a clean read until we kind of get through that at the end of the day. Yeah, and I think almost until you get into July, because then you got the end of the quarter uh, exactly. coming up uh, next week here, and then the holiday here in the U.S. Anyway, we are moving closer to to those uh, closing bells and right here in the most important hour of the trading day. Stick with us. Full coverage right here on Bloomberg. The Closing Bell. 
Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele here to take you through the closing bell as we begin our global simulcast to parse the most crucial moments of the day. Scarlet Fu here in the TV studio. I believe Carol Master came in today in the radio booth and Tim Stenedek, who's always here as well as we welcome our audiences across all of our or Bloomberg is it platforms. My digital twin. Uh, ooh. Ooh, Carol, you always go dark here on these simulcasts here. And, well, a somewhat of a dark day in the equity market, at least if you're a tech stock. Red on the screen for the Nasdaq and the S&P, though a little bit of life for Dow Transports and Industrials. Well, speaking of the tech uh, area, the SOX down about 2.6%, so down more than the overall equity trade in a big way. Keep in mind, it's had quite a run since mid-April, up about 30%, far outpacing the S&P 500. But investors definitely pulling on, uh, pulling back on the semi-space today. Yeah, worst day for the SOX going back to May 1st. So, you know, going back quite quite a bit uh, to last month, Scarlett. We saw quite a reversal, though, in, in chip names today, which I found pretty surprising, especially given that we saw super micro hire and Dell hire after that news about the companies teaming up with XAI. Yeah, you're hearing a lot of commentary like buyer fatigue, overbought conditions. Uh, it's worth noting as well that the eco data that did come out, and I like how Cameron Kreis, Bloomberg's macro strategist, put it. It's all B-list uh, eco data, but they all generally Ouch. point. Ouch. To, yeah, I know. <laughs> they all generally point to softer activity overall. So that combined with what we've been hearing from retail sales, um, the data doesn't look supportive necessarily of further gains, at least in the short term. I'm, okay, looks like, guys, we're not going to get that 30-second record. This is a moment, not 30-second record. All right, interesting moves here in the day. You are seeing yield slightly higher. Bitcoin trying to get its mojo back. But right now, all the activity in the equity market seems to be shifting, at least for today, a rotation to a certain extent into the Dow Jones Industrial Average and Dow Transport. Uh, each up about a percent on the day. Dow Jones Industrial Average up eight-tenths of a percent. Dow Transport's up more than one. Meanwhile, the S&P 500 is going to close out the day lower by about 14 points, right around that 54.73 level, down about three-tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq Composite down more than 140 points, at eight-tenths of a percent. And the Russell 2000 going to close out the day lower by eight points, or about four-tenths of one percent. All right, Romain, back to the S&P 500 I go. Um, a little bit of an even split, but a little bit more to the upside. 289 names in the index actually um, gaining some ground on this Thursday. 213 to the downside and Scarlet one unchanged. All right, let's uh, take a look at the sectors in the S&P 500. There's 11 of them, but the biggest one, technology, is a real loser here on the day. Uh, that's the biggest red slice of the pie. The group off by 1.6 percent. Uh, REITs and staples also losing a little bit of ground. The best performers, energy stocks. Uh, 21 of 22 members are higher. Wow. Um, and if you are looking at it from a valuation point of view, they are certainly cheap because they are cheaper on a PE basis uh, than any other sector in the S&P. All right, guys, the number one gainer in both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100, Gilead Sciences. Uh, this went up about 8.5%, so just off its highs at its best levels today, up about 10%, but still a big gain. Uh, the company's experimental twice yearly shot, preventing 100% of HIV cases in women and adolescent girls in Africa. It's the first successful big trial of what's hoped to become a powerful new drug regimen for fending off the virus. As you know, we have not found an HIV vaccine as of yet. So this is a big deal. And about 1.3 million people are infected with HIV around the globe every year. So this could be potentially a big step forward. Uh, we're going to actually talk with Dr. Anthony Fauci uh, in the next hour. So curious to see what he has to say, because he's done a lot of work, certainly in the HIV area. We talked about the SOX. Uh, not a great day, but AMD did have a bullish day. Up about 4.5% in today's session. Number three gainer in the NASDAQ 100. Piper Sandler making the chip maker a top pick in the large cap space uh, heading into the second half of the year. So some upbeat momentum in that one. And this one for something a little bit different. I know it's a, a small uh, cap company. I oh, know. I always get a little nervous that you're going to jump all over me. Um, Renpack Holdings. Ticker is PAC. It was up 21% at its highs today. Up uh, at the close about 14%. Amazon announcing it has replaced 95% of the plastic air pillows from delivery what? packaging in North America in North America with 100% recycled paper filter um, oh. so filler so oh, that's why I haven't seen all the paper in the Amazon boxes because of them 
I guess. Wow. Yeah. Better than that styrofoam stuff. I guess yeah. if I had been paying attention, I would have See? It's kind of re rode the rally there. You learn something <laughs> yeah. new every day. Well, Those small go. caps, micro caps. Okay, it's not a micro cap. In fact, it's the complete opposite. It's a mega cap tech company, but it is the worst performer in the S&P 500 today on a points basis. NVIDIA shares, they were higher by as much as 3.8%, but fell as much as 4.5%. They closed the day down by 3.5%. They were higher along with uh, other AI companies after Dell CEO said that the the company is building an AI factory for XAI with NVIDIA. Where um, is this factory going to be? It's Well, you know, we, we talked with Ashley Vance a little bit about it. We shouldn't really think of it like it's an actual factory, right? Uh, I think that's uh, fair to say. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, what, what is it? Just Server like racks. Okay. Yeah, those sorts of things. Uh, okay. I yeah. Widgets will not be made. Widgets will not be made. There will not, not be, be making AI in okay. this factory. There right. will be training. AI. Training, okay. They were training ominous. the AI to come after us. <laughs> okay. To come after us. That's worse. Hey, yeah, yes. I think I'm pretty sure I saw a horror movie about this. But but <laughs> speaking of AI, uh, Qualcomm. Uh, let's look at shares of Qualcomm and how they closed out the day. They did fall as much as 6.3%. They finished off their lows, still down by more than 5%. Biggest intraday decline going back to, to February. Comes after a Wall Street Journal report about Samsung's new AI laptop glitches. Link's equity strategists uh, note that the report does not bode well for Qualcomm, which does supply the processor to these. The journal did report that Samsung didn't provide a detailed cause of the problem, but noted operational conditions on the laptops with the Windows 11 ARM and the Qualcomm processor. Also want to check in on shares of AutoNation ticker AN. Uh, it's the largest automotive retailer in the U.S. Shares fell by 3.6% today. Auto retailers across the U.S. suffering a second major disruption in two days due to another cyber attack at CDK Global. It's the software provider that thousands of car dealers use and they rely on to run their stores. They do car repair orders. They do customer records, schedule appointments. They weren't able to do any of this stuff yesterday. Yeah. Um, still an issue uh, for uh, these companies. Uh, shares down by 3.6% at AutoNation. And then uh, DJT, Trump Media and Technology Group, shares falling today uh, by more than 14%. The SEC did declare effective a regulatory filing that could dilute shareholders. Um, and that shit made uh, shares fall on the day. Uh, yeah, can you imagine though with AutoNation they have to like push paper around now? Like that's it's, a whole different world than we were yeah, uh, in before. Keith yeah, Keith Naughton described the software as part of the spine for auto dealerships. Ah, that's a good way of looking yeah. at it. Um, I'm looking at the mar mar bond market, guys. A little bit of a sell-off. Yields up just a bit uh, off the highs of the session, uh, to be sure. We did have a tips auction uh, that was pretty strong, actually. Uh, we had about $21 billion in tips. That was strong. At that moment, we're pushing back against all the supply. Not there yet, guys. All right, we are talking about fast food, fast casual food uh, today on The Closing Bell. We're going to talk about the Chipotle Boy Bowl. Apparently, it's uh, two scoops of chicken, there's some black beans, there's corn, there's sour cream. Basically, Chipotle is really acknowledging... Listen up. This could be for you. No. It's a young urban, you well, they're young urban male oh. office Ouch, workers that, oh. <laughs> that eat at Chipotle about five to Why seven days I'm a week. Young, right? It's a limited time <laughs> offer, and you can get oh, the cool Chipotle boy. Keep talking, keep talking. <laughs> Help me, Tim. Uh, okay, so the Chipotle boy starter pack, Chipotle tweeted about this. You got AirPods. You yeah. got some you know, aviators. You know these yeah. dudes. You got your puffy vest. Yeah. You got your laptop <laughs> yeah. with you because you're doing oh, your yeah. you're doing your work. It all sounds like me. Double chicken, <laughs> Double white chicken. rice, black beans, mild salsa, corn salsa, sour you cream. You like your puffy cheese vest. Cheese and guac. a great place downtown. Lettuce Double out there. chicken, please. You what about there? finance gals? Yeah. I, like, I don't know. Yeah, this feels a little... That's sweet green. Well said. Yeah. Well said. Yeah, but come that's on. I mean, girls eat Chipotle. I don't know. I just feel like that's a little out of touch, Although but whatever. That sweet green is now making a run for the finance bros as well, right? With their uh, steak uh, addition. So, so, so they're, they're going after the same market. So then what the heck is a McDonald's doing? Because I was told I can walk in there and get five for five bucks and just walk out with like can get a lot. You can. You can get a a lot. Exactly. Yeah. What? Fries, right? A sandwich. And what else? Coke. And four-piece chicken McNuggets. And with, the, with the sandwich? Yes. Yeah. That's kind of That will fill isn't it? you up. I know. I, I, Is there a Sunday that comes with that? No. But uh, no. you also have Wendy's and Burger King also have similar things. But the yeah. idea is that McDonald's has the ability to have this kind of value war. Like, they can execute. The price war is long? on. The price war is on in the fast food space. It's huh. really interesting that apparently, you know, customers have been cutting back, I guess, going to McDonald's. So, you know, they're cutting their prices, I guess, to bring them in. But, I mean, how much money can they make on something that's $5? 
But I think it's more the point of like they're trying to show that they're still value. I, I so when you also, said, oh, look, yeah. th this menu item might be 18 bucks or 10 bucks, they want to be like, remember us? We are value. But yeah. it, also, it also brings people in the store. So if you go in the store because you're enticed by this $5 meal, yeah. then you, maybe you'll buy that. And, and Romaine, maybe you'll buy something else that is, you know, that's higher margins. It's possible if I ever set foot in a McDonald's. But, I, I, but, but the thing is, you remember, like for a while, they kind of staked their claim to that, right? When yeah. Yeah. the dollar menus and they yeah. got but things kinda, were a lot cheaper. Kind of shifted then, right? away from that. And there's been a lot of anecdotal evidence of people saying, look, I went into McDonald's, bought this basic, you know, meal and it was like, you know, fifteen bucks. And yeah. like this is McDonald's. I shouldn't be paying fifteen bucks for this. And now they're so, yes. they're yeah. they're conceding that point to yeah. people who say that. One thing that's interesting is Darden Restaurants, which uh, runs Olive Garden, they've refused to get in on this price war. Good they're saying yeah, they say yeah. that they're stick offering price the certainty. Yeah. Stick mm. it to the man, stick right. it to us. Yeah. Oh yeah, yes. What about stick the trader bros, man? Are we the are we the man? Man, I, when that happened, <laughs> no one told me. <laughs> oh my God, the tour of Italy though can be really good. I don't oh, know if yeah. they still offer it, but it used to be oh. really What's yummy. What's in the tour of wow. Italy? Oh, it's a little like bit of everything. And, and get the shrimp <laughs> no, no, and it's like some pasta, yeah. some like that. veal parmesan. Stuff. You get a little bit of everything, veal a little parmesan. lasagna. You get a little red wine with All right. that. Ooh. See you later, alligator. All right, that's a wrap across platform coverage. Radio, TV, YouTube, so and Bloomberg Originals. You are done. We call it the closing bell. Folks, we will see you same time, same place tomorrow. We are not done here on Bloomberg Television. Stick with us. In just a bit, we're going to take a deeper dive into some of the opportunities in emerging markets. Christine Philpott is going to be joining us, portfolio manager over at Ariel Investments. That's coming up next here on The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Romaine Bostic. Let's take a look at how markets ended the day here on this Thursday. Of course, coming off the Juneteenth holiday on Wednesday where markets were closed. We reopened today. It looked like we were going to get a little bit of pop in the shares. But nevertheless, a lot of folks had other intentions in mind. The S&P 500 down about a quarter of a percent, but the biggest laggards today were in the tech space. You see that in the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, led by a big drop in NVIDIA, 3% lower for the index as a whole here. But interesting, Scarlett, you did see a pop in some other names like Endow Transports and Endow Industrial. So I don't know, is this a rotation out of tech into something else or I don't know, how should we read That this? could very well be the case. Yeah. We know that chip makers have had quite a run. So if you look at some of the big decliners in the chip space, Qualcomm caught my attention off by 5%, um, at one point falling as much as 6.3%. Analysts note that a Wall Street Journal report on Samsung's new AI laptop glitches is a bad sign for Qualcomm because it does make some of the processors for those devices. Now on the flip side, you have gains in MGM Resorts, up almost 3% on the day. Uh, that's a three-week high. The company plans to offer online betting for games like Roulette and Baccarat with live dealers based at two of its Las Vegas casinos on the Strip. We're talking about the Bellagio and MGM Grand. These live dealers are apparently a big business for online betting companies, which hosts broadcasts uh, from studios all over the world, and they'll basically mimic the experience of gambling at a casino for the users who are playing from home. Now, our top story this hour, it is summer solstice. The first day of summer brings brings us the longest day of the year, we know that, and in 2024, this year, the first heat wave of the season for a large swath of the U.S. Higher temperatures are set to boost natural gas consumption and stress the electrical grids. The nat gas inventory for now is plentiful after a warm winter, but that surplus will likely be drawn down quickly in the next few months. We'll examine the weather patterns impact on global commodity prices, crop yields, and energy demand. All right, Scarlett, let's take a quick look at though, what's going on in the FX space. We had some breaking news cross the wire a little while ago involving the U.S. Treasury Department adding Japan to its monitoring list for foreign exchange practices. It stopped short of labeling it or any other trade partner as a currency manipulator. Let's get some insights out of our senior Washington correspondent, Salia Motion. Uh, Salia, uh, walk us through this here. Normally when we get these, uh, uh, these reports about currency manipulation, all the talk is about China. How did Japan end up on this watch list? We've had a really interesting six months, actually, with Federal Reserve interest rates being at their highest levels in 20 years, uh, and we're seeing a wider interest rate differential from other central banks. The U.S. dollar has appreciated a lot. And what that's meant is that other smaller currencies like Japan and other uh, Asian currencies have actually had to prop up their uh, exchange rates to compete with the dollar. And that's interesting because usually they want to work down their exchange rate against the dollar 
dollar to give a boost to their manufacturing sector. But that interest rate differential just got so wide that the yen plunged and the Japanese central bank was having to prop up its currency. And so that is actually not the reason that Japan was added to the monitoring list, because this report concluded its findings and collecting data before that yen intervention actually happened. Mm -hmm. The Treasury Department is citing bilateral trade deficits as the reason for adding them to the monitoring list. Hmm, Interesting. And of course, uh, Japan's government did intervene last time. The dollar yen rate got to about 160.17, and we're getting close to that point again. Remain mentioned China. China remains on this list, doesn't it? Absolutely. China is still on the list. They've been on the list for years. Uh, They've been designated a a currency manipulator during the Trump era. That is no longer the tag that's being applied. Uh, The concern that the Biden Treasury Department has on China is transparency. They see some anomalies in the data that they presented to the U.S. Treasury Department. And so they're asking for more transparency into the currency markets in China. Salio Mosin down there in Washington, a closer look at the U.S. government's watch list for currency manipulators, Japan being added to it. Of course, China always on it. And let's stick with China and emerging markets overall right now. Our next guest sees plenty of opportunity there. Christine Philpott's joining us, portfolio manager and senior research analyst at Ariel Investments. And Christine, I was going to ask you a bunch of questions about what's going on in Latin America and all these other places. But I noticed that you and your team have increased your allocation in China. And I think you might be the first person we've had on the program that has had a meaningful increase in their allocation, at least this year. 30% right now of your EM portfolio? That's right. Why? So we're seeing many opportunities in the Chinese markets. I think um, as value investors, clearly the Chinese market um, was worth digging into for us, given how compelling the valuations are currently. You know, you're having a market that's trading at single-digit forward PEs for strong double-digit earnings growth, one of the the cheapest markets Mm -hmm. in the world today and one of the biggest value plays, we think, in the world today. Um, But valuation is a um, necessary but not sufficient condition for a market to be attractive for us. We also want to see signs of an inflection point, or as we call it, a catalyst. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see that in China, Um, particularly from a bottoms-up standpoint, many of the companies we've added or increased positioning in over the last couple of weeks um, are companies where we're seeing capital allocation improvements already starting to occur. Mm -hmm. We're seeing um, an acceleration of earnings growth, really being driven by cost reductions, being driven by favorable product mix shift, which Mm -hmm. is improving the margin profile, Mm -hmm. and being driven by higher return of capital to shareholders um, at a rate that we haven't seen over, you know, for over a decade. Mm-hmm. So you think those are really promising signals um, yeah. of a turnaround being at hand at a bottoms-up standpoint. Uh, and you are bottom-up investors. You're also long-term investors yes. here. I mean, how long, and this may be a difficult question to answer, but how long is it going to take before you would see or you think you're going to see the returns that would make this worth your while? Is this sort of like a two-year process, a five-year process, 10 years, what? So our average holding period um, tends to be about three years. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's how we think about our investment horizon. Mm -hmm. Um, But as I mentioned, for many of the companies we've made investments in, we're already starting to see those improvements take place Mm -hmm. um, in terms of earnings growth accelerating, and more importantly, in terms of returning capital to shareholders. Just to share one statistic, Mm -hmm. in the first three months of 2024, if you look at all the listed companies in China, the amount of share repurchases, the value of share repurchases over those first three months is about 70% of the 12-month average Hmm. over the last 10 years. So it's a meaningful step up that we're seeing. But from a top-down standpoint, even though the macro data remains mixed in China, as we've seen from the latest data come out in May, um, we think that the downside is not as bad as feared. Hmm. Um, Particularly if we think about a market like real estate, Mm -hmm. um, even though we see pricing pressure continuing, we've seen a meaningful decrease in inventories that are off over 60% from the 2021 peaks. Um, And so we're seeing, and we're also seeing um, statistics like loan to value ratios that are much lower, about 50%, than in other markets that have faced real estate pressures where those loan to value ratios were 100%. Mm -hmm. So we think it's a combination of those bottoms up fundamentals, as well as, again, the the top down picture maybe, and the downside of the top down picture not being maybe as bad as currently priced in. Okay, that makes sense, and especially from a value perspective, I can see how you make your case. A trade that's been fairly popular is to uh, be bearish on China and be bullish on India, India being the recipient of Mm -hmm. a lot of the attention that China got as this... uh, the factory to the world. Mm -hmm. Now, your take on India is also contrarian because you are pairing your exposure to that country. 
Yes, yeah, so we've had um, a meaningful underweight to that country. Um, so it's about 10% today underweight relative to the bench. Um, and the reason is, you know, we think India is the market everyone loves to love. <laughs> Um, so, it, and we do think it has attractive fundamentals, right? So we see strong GDP growth outlook. Um, we see companies that have um, double-digit earnings growth profile for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. um, so we agree with that fundamental outlook. The thing is, we think that that's already priced in, and we think that there's little upside left from here. So if you look at the MSCI India index, it's trading at 22 times forward PE. Mm -hmm. um, we think we could find similar earnings growth and similar GDP growth in other markets at a fraction of the multiple. So if you look at Vietnam, for example, trading at 12 times forward PE, um, companies are trading that what we expect to have double digit, strong double digit earnings growth. We think that's a much more attractive market. We could get similar growth at a fraction of the multiple. Okay, so this growth story is intact. It's just that maybe it's been played out for now. Um, let's bring up Latin America because Romain had mentioned it earlier. A lot of people, and here it's Morgan Stanley really, uh, see LATAM as a relative safe haven from geopolitical conflicts. Uh, you've got wars in Europe and the Middle East, you've got rising tensions in Asia, but LATAM maybe, you know, it may play a key role here as countries reorganize their supply chains, countries and companies, uh, for everything from uh, food to metals to fuels to pharma ingredients. How are you thinking about LATAM in that context? So I think it's an interesting hypothesis, and we've definitely seen um, beneficiaries, including Mexico, of this remapping of supply chains away from China. And we think that there is potential for that to play out. Um, we think the challenge with certain Latin American countries becomes um, how the countries and the economic policies are implemented at home. Mm. Um, so taking Mexico, for example, um, you know, clearly a recipient of the shift away from China. Um, however, you know, af at the, after the recent elections that occurred, there's clearly a lot of um, noise, so to speak, around what is the political trajectory in that country going forward, particularly yeah. with some of the reforms that are being proposed um, domestically. Um, Brazil is a market where we see attractive bottoms-up opportunities, so mm. that's our um, largest relative holding in Latin America. Mm -hmm. um, but even in Brazil, there are questions around, um, you know, what is the Lula government going to prioritize going forward, and how much of that will impact potentially monetary and fiscal policy. Yeah. Um, so in Latin America, we think that it is a country that's maybe outside of the geopolitical headlines versus a China, mm -hmm. um, but where there's still some um, questions that we need to ask ourselves as investors to make sure that we're continuously aligned with what the country's trying to achieve. All right, Christine, I'm going to leave it there, and we got to get you back to talk about some of the other uh, Southeast Asian nations and some of the opportunities there. Christine Philpotts over at Aerial Investment Portfolio Manager and Senior Research Analyst. We want to get you to some breaking news. This involving Lending Tree. The shares are down on back of a data breach. We've been talking a lot about that today, primarily when it comes to the automakers and now Lending Tree saying that one of its units was hacked, data was stolen, and that now data is on the dark web. It said that in Snowflake, uh, one of the big software company was the one that notified it of the breach. Those shares also slightly lower here in after hours trading. We're going to get you some more details and bring it to you first right here on The Close on Bloomberg. Time now for the top three, where we name drop the people driving some of the day's most talked about stories. And first up is Donald Sutherland. The Hollywood icon has died at the age of 88, according to his son, Kiefer Sutherland. Now, depending on how old you are, you know Donald as President Snow in The Hunger Games, the patriarch in Six Degrees of Separation, or maybe Hawkeye Pierce in the movie version of MASH, which Romain really speaks to the duration and longevity of his acting career, 50 plus years from 1970 to 2023. Yeah, I think it was the Associated Press uh, obituary that I found funny. He talked a lot about how nobody thought he could be a leading man when he was first coming out, saying that he was too ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't have the looks for it. And of course, you know, you talk again, you talk about just the breadth of his career. It's more than 200 roles over yeah. the course of that career and and big roles, too. Right. Memorable roles. And Absolutely. he may not have been the leading, leading man, but everybody knows who Donald Sutherland and was. And you never forgot yeah. his voice or his face. Uh, he has a yeah. memoir coming out in November, so yeah. uh, he was working right up until the very end. Yeah, uh, certainly a, a sad day, but one to also celebrate uh, the life and career of Donald Sutherland. Another person that I've been keeping an eye on, who's also doing a little bit of celebrating, is the rapper Kendrick Lamar. He hosted a Juneteenth show out at the Los Angeles Forum. And well, 
the backdrop of this was a lot different. This could have just been any old concert, but of course, coming off his big battle that he had mm -hmm. with Drake, uh, where they released a, a bunch of competing diss tracks against each other, and let's just face it, Kendrick won that hands down. Uh, he performed at least three of those tracks, including Not Like Us. Uh, I forgot how many times Five he performed times. that song, uh, but uh, it was a showstopper. Uh, and honestly, just the fact he had everyone on stage. It was a who's who yeah. of Los Angeles and West Coast rappers, from, from old folks like Dr. Dre to sort of some of the new school kids as well. Uh, it was great, and it was streamed live, so if you had a chance to watch it, and if you don't, it's all over uh, all over your social media. Yeah, it's streamed on Amazon, and of course, um, yeah. that class photo, I can't wait to look at it in, you yeah. know, in, in, in close up mode because it has think, everyone. Do you think Drake was watching this at the time? Uh, yeah. Even if he wasn't, he's watching yeah. it now, yeah. <laughs> one way or well, another. Well, he watches the show. He's a big fan of the clothes. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard. All right, third on the docket for us is J.D. Vance, the author turned senator, <laughs> has emerged as a high probability vice president pick on Donald Trump's ticket this November. This guy? Yeah, well, you know, he's more ideologically in tune with uh, Trump than any other candidate on the former president's VP shortlist, uh, and that includes Doug Burgum, okay. uh, Marco Rubio, and Marco Tim Scott. Scott. That's quite the short list. <laughs> yeah, uh, well. All right. Well, good for J.D. Vance. He's come a long way here uh, from his uh, roots there, uh, you know, as a poor, poor boy from Appalachia. Mm, so well, glad, okay. glad to see that he finally made it. Yeah, I know. Well, there you go. Pollster Frank Luntz said he's a younger and more articulate version of Trump, which may actually end up working against him if Trump reads that quote. All right, coming up, parts of the U.S. are feeling the burn from record temperatures across the East Coast. We're going to talk about the weather and we're going to talk about the economics behind it. That's coming up next on The Close on Bloomberg. Scarlet Food tells me that the summer solstice is upon us, 4.50 Eastern time. It's Google told to hit. me that. So. The longest day of the year. No, you got on it, Scarlett. It's the longest day of the year, but it's also proving to be one of the hottest for those here in the eastern part of the United States, as well as over there in Europe. As for what's causing such heat waves, Bloomberg's Alina Ganatra can explain. The world is getting hotter and no one is immune. But just how hot is too hot? It's not as straightforward as reading off a standard thermometer. Instead, scientists often use something called wet bulb temperature. But how does this work? In hot climates, people have one key method to stay cool, sweat. How much that can keep you cool depends on the humidity as well as the dry air temperature. And a wet bulb temperature measures both of these things. It's quite literally a thermometer wrapped in a wet cloth, and it shows the lowest temperature a person can cool themselves down to by sweating. Many researchers say that the highest livable wet bulb temperature for humans is 35 degrees Celsius. Past that point, you stop being able to maintain your core body temperature. And if you can't cool down quick enough, your organs start to shut down. Global warming is pushing us closer and closer to that limit. According to NASA, global temperatures have increased over 1.1 degrees Celsius since 1880. And since 2011, that's made 70% of extreme weather events, like heat waves, more likely or more severe. And this trend is only set to continue, with global temperatures predicted to hit record levels over the next five years. For people in already hot climates, every part of life will become harder. But those in cooler climates won't get off easy either. Food could get more expensive as harvests get smaller. Energy prices could jump too as demand increases when more people switch on their air conditioning. At the same time, energy supply is squeezed as the heat makes coal, gas and nuclear power plants less efficient. Scientists are split on when we'll hit that critical wet bulb threshold. Some think we've already passed that point in many places along the equator, although not for very long. Others predict that areas in the Middle East and Southeast Asia will be regularly crossing that critical 35 degrees Celsius mark by 2075. But on the direction of travel, the consensus is clear. Extreme heat is becoming more common and more dangerous. And no matter where you live, no one will be able to avoid the consequences. That was Bloomberg's Alina Ganatra reporting. So speaking of the consequences, let's talk about that and get some more context on these record temperatures and their impact on global commodities, crop yields and energy demand. Jim Romer, publisher of the Weather Wealth Newsletter, joins us now. Jim, it is great to speak with you. Um, Alina mentioned, of course, energy prices and nat gas comes to mind first and foremost because that's how most of North America, at least, uh, powers its uh, air conditioning and heat in the winter. 
Now, we know that when it gets hotter, there's a strain on natural gas resources, but I guess you could make the argument that because we had a warm winter, there's a lot of inventory built up. Absolutely. We've seen really over the last four or five winters record warm temperatures. What I believe certainly is climate change, not solar cycles, maybe partly El Nino. A person can sell natural gas almost every year in the last five years in November and make 30 to 40 percent of their money. Now we have record hot temperatures, but because of large inventories, it's going to take consistent heat and several major hurricanes in the Gulf that may happen in September and October to really get us to new highs in natural gas. We have a lot of supplies right now. Okay, so there's a bit of a cushion to work off of there for now when it comes to nat gas. Let's talk a little bit about El Nino. You just mentioned it. These specific weather patterns also have a big impact. What do we know in terms of El Nino and La Nina? Well, El Nino, which is a warm ocean current off the coast of Peru along the equator, really hurt the tropical commodities the most. Cocoa prices soared 150 percent with a 30 percent reduction in some areas of Ivory Coast and Ghana, the biggest producer of chocolate in the world. Sugar prices had a bull market last year, droughts in Southeast Asia, and now coffee is being affected. Along the equator, that's where climate change really is the most severe. We're going into a La Nina situation over the next few months. If it holds off till September of October, that will mean that Midwest grain crops benefit from warmer temperatures and also rains. If La Nina happens more quickly, cooler ocean temperatures off the coast of Peru to Australia, then we can have a bull market in corn and soybeans. But right now, it's really the tropical commodities along the equator that have been affected most by both El Nino and also La Nina conditions coming up. It's interesting, too, that, uh, Jim, uh, on this day, as we talk about, of course, uh, this uh, what could potentially be a record a heat wave, uh, at least in certain parts of the U.S., and not to mention over there in Europe and in India as well, that we also got our first named uh, tropical storm, Lisa, uh, here in North America so far, uh, Alberto uh, strengthening off the coast of Mexico. I, I know we're still kind of early in the hurricane season, but do you anticipate that this season could continue that trend of more storms and storms coming earlier in the season than in the past? Well, actually, this is, uh, I think, the latest in many years that a tropical storm actually formed. NOAA, many other hurricane uh, uh, forecasting services out there are predicting a near record number of hurricanes over the next few months, particularly September and October is the key. We've seen more Category 5 hurricanes explode from what I believe is definitely a, a warming planet, climate change, in the last four years within 24 to 48 hours. There was Hurricane Harvey that affected uh, much of the crude oil facilities and refineries in Houston, I think it was 2017. We've had several major hurricanes in Florida and the Gulf the last few years. So it's going to be a wild crude oil and natural gas market, most likely, in the peak of the season in September and October. Not only because the La Nina is going to be forming, which tends to reduce shear and increase hurricane activity, but also because ocean temperatures near Florida, 100 degrees. It's unbelievable right now what's going on. I am curious as to what the sort of the potential effect on financial markets is going to be. And I mean that outside of the space of commodities, that's always easy to kind of determine. But I feel like when we're talking about these things, it seems like they're having much broader effects, whether it's on, I don't know, insurance companies or uh, other parts of other sectors of the market here. Where are you seeing the potential financial impact, whether to the upside or to the downside? Yeah, I mean, that's a complex question. Certainly with our hurricanes, a lot of um, energy stocks tend to rise. Uh, at least temporarily. We have hot summers like I expect this year or, or this summer over most of the country. Uh, you know, uh, beer company stocks go up. There's more demand for that. Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, things like that. As far as, a, as the global economy itself, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, we need to really find new solutions to fight climate change, in my opinion. That could actually be a spur in, in the green economy, which we're actually seeing right now in a lot of areas. But uh, we have to just take this one step at a time as far as how the hurricanes and heat waves uh, affect the, the equity market. Certainly, uh, you know, the, the stronger dollar and many other factors right now are influencing uh, many stocks and, and also commodity prices. Jim, you advise hedge funds, farmers, and commodity traders as to the long-term and short-term impact of weather impacts in the futures markets. What's the number one question you're getting from, from the smart money, from hedge funds? Well, you know, everyone wants to know about the grain market because we're a big supplier of grains. We had major droughts and floods in South America that reduced corn and soybean crops about 10 to 15 percent a few months ago. Why haven't grain prices rallied? Because of the stronger dollar and the, and the worries about the Chinese economy, a big importer. So everyone really wants to know, are we going to have a drought this summer? What about cocoa and coffee, which have been in long-standing bull markets because of warming along the equator? So I guess right, right now, the stronger dollar 
weakened demand for many commodities, and also El Nino that brought havoc around the world that's weakened and is pretty much over with right now, could mean that most commodities the next few months could be entering more longer-term bear markets. Hmm. And again, we have to see what, how climate change and, and the formation of La Nina uh, could maybe reverse that trend, depending uh, in the next few months, the timing of all these different uh, phenomena happening around the world. Okay, but that might be good news for inflation. Jim, really appreciate your joining us. Jim Romer, who publishes the Weather Wealth newsletter and advises hedge funds and farmers as well. Now, let's shift gears and move to our Muni moment, because cities across the U.S. are competing to tap federal funds for new clean energy and climate projects. But that means filling out a lot of applications and making pitches. And that's where grant writers come in. This scramble for funds has led to a major expansion of grant writing roles in city governments. Aubrey Ralph is the Director of Strategy and Research at the Ford Group. It's a group that helps communities apply and manage grants. And Aubrey joins us now. Aubrey, it is great to speak with you. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Um, we know Uncle Sam is ready to provide a lot of money through the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, and the CHIPS Act. Tell us what demand from state and local governments looks like for your services and how that's evolved over the last one to two years. Yes, there's a, a huge demand um, for those resources and, and community communities that are positioning themselves uh, to uh, write those grants are in a, a good position uh, to potentially uh, win, especially with this Infl in, 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 uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, funding. Um, so we're, we're here to assist those committee members. And um, the more that they know about um, the data that's, that's collected in their community um, and um, the stakeholders that are their trusted, me uh, trusted messengers and, and trusted nonprofit organizations, um, if those strategic plans are already in place, um, it gives them a better opportunity to win, and, and we're here to help them strategize around those, uh, those proposals. So let's take a step back and talk a little bit about the applications that uh, these city governments need to fill out. How complicated are these applications? I take it it's a lot more than just filling out two pages. Correct. Yeah, the, the grant applications can be as, as large as 50 to 100 pages. Um, but they're very detailed in terms of, of telling the organization what they need to look out for. Um, with the Inflation Reduction Act, it, it's pretty good about uh, giving the links and the resources that you would then um, find um, mapping to show where the need is in your community. Um, and then uh, understanding that and then creating a solution uh, to that problem. And, and theoretically, if your organization already has a climate action strategy plan, you have organizations that are already geared uh, to meet those challenges, it really does help uh, to, to help you understand what, that grant, what the grant guidelines are and how you can uh, better position yourself um, yeah. for these competitive opportunities. So, so you're helping this kind of speed up the process or at least make it a little bit easier for those folks seeking the grants. What about the other side of this? And I know you have less control over what the, the government and, and the other folks on the other end do here. But are we going to start to see maybe a little bit more urgency on their side of the equation? Yes, I, I, we already see the, the, the urgency. And I, I think what it looks like is um, smaller windows to actually administer the grant project. Um, so once again, the agencies that are already um, administering those programs focused on env environmental compliance or have some infrastructure uh, in place to move forward, um, that those uh, the grants are, are really geared toward um, that type of, of project or quote unquote shovel ready uh, projects. I am curious, Aubrey. I mean, I, I don't want to get too into politics here, but we're, we are in an election season. It's possible that we could get a change in administration. If, we, if that were to happen, do you think things like the IRA and some of the other sort of uh, uh, legislative measures uh, that I think have fed into your forward platform, fed into the grant making process, that that would be disrupted? Well, uh, for we've been able to administer roughly a billion dollars throughout the country. Um, programs that range from um, assistance to uh, COVID response. We've been able to assist state of uh, New York with a uh, small business program, uh, state of Washington, Department of Commerce with a, a tax rebate program around um, hospitality industry. We're in Los Angeles County focused on a, um, a, a program administering uh, funds to give 
survivors of, of domestic violence, their financial independence. So grant funding, the, the agenda may change, but the need is always there. The need is ever growing and these ever changing um, demands are always uh, needed, needed to be met by municipalities and nonprofit agencies. So the, the capacity um, that they're going to require um, uh, to help administer those funds is always there. So I, whatever the agenda is, I think the need is always going to be there. Um, so I don't, I don't see any grants going any, anywhere anytime soon. All right, Aubrey, going to catch up with you, I think, in a few months and see whether there's any reason to update that. Appreciate you taking time for us today. Aubrey Ralph of the Forward a Platform there, the Director of Strategy and Research there, uh, Scarlett. And, you know, this is a big deal. Anytime you get that fiscal policy, those, those yeah. fiscal dollars flowing, of course, there's people like Aubrey that you need to kind of help facilitate that, where that money goes and make sure it goes to the right folks. You know what else you yeah. need? You need what? humanities majors, people who humanities graduated majors. from Liberal Arts College and studied English, studied history, because it's a lot of writing. You can't feed this to AI? <laughs> Not yet, at least. There you have it. Scarlett Fu helping out our humanities majors there. Yeah, I'm a big believer in stay the liberal strong. arts. Yeah, stay strong. All right, let's take a look at how markets close on the day. Speaking of AI, um, NVIDIA and Apple, big decliners today, and they dragged the Magnificent Seven down as a group, even though there are plenty of other names within that cohort that did rise. So overall, the S&P 500 did not set a record. Yeah, did not set a record. Uh, it should be interesting, too, while you're speaking of NVIDIA. I just saw uh, something crossing the wire here that Jensen Wong actually registering to sell about 120,000 uh, shares uh, mm. that, that he holds, which is kind of a drop in the bucket, yeah. uh, at least certainly for him and certainly for the stock overall, but certainly taking advantage here of this uh, record run in the shares. He's certainly still very, very exposed. And we should mention, of course, uh, dollar yen is something else we're keeping an eye on. The yen is weaker versus the dollar for a sixth straight day. And the U.S. has added it as for consideration as a, you know, a, a currency to yeah. monitor. Yeah, a currency to monitor. I was kind of surprised by that, right? Weren't we, weren't we like begging for them to do some intervention earlier this year? Well, and now, now we're saying, hey, don't do that. You're a manipulator. Don't do too much. We're, we're keeping an eye on you. This is The Close on Bloomberg. About one third of CFOs see the U.S. election impacting investments. That's according to a new survey out by uh, Duke University, along with a couple of the Federal Reserve Bank's monetary policy, inflation and labor market, all top concerns over the next 12 months. Nina Trentman joining us right now. I'm told she's senior editor here at Bloomberg, but she's also more importantly, the author of a new newsletter here at Bloomberg called CFO briefing. All right, Nina. So this means you really have your finger on the pulse of what the CFOs <laughs> are going to be saying. Let's start off with the survey because I thought it was interesting. First, let's start with the worries. They all basically saying, I guess, the same things everyone's worried about, which is, you know, with the Fed, the labor market, inflation, rates, et cetera. Yeah. So they're still worried about that, right? Yeah. Like yeah. The, the combination of things that people are worried about yeah. hasn't really changed very much. Like the, the yeah. top main things, high interest rates, inflation, and then also labor, both um, in availability of labor as well as the cost of labor. Hmm. Um, but then also if you look at sort of the optimism rating overall, out of a, on a scale from zero to 100, CFOs sort of clock in at 60, which is, yeah, you can talk a little bit about the glass being half full, half yeah. empty. 60 is still um, not too bad. Yeah. Well, provide some context for us. How does this compare to, say, June 2016 before uh, a previous presidential election? Yeah, that is an interesting one. So um, for this survey specifically, they asked about sort of how does the upcoming election in November influence your investment decisions. And what we're seeing now is that um, CFOs are saying, about a third are saying it is impacting uh, decisions first and foremost. And then 28% are saying it's leading us to either delay, postpone, um, some even are saying scrap investment plans, mm -hmm. um, which of course is a sizable number. Interestingly, going back to 2016, when Duke also asked this question, there was a higher proportion of CFOs who said that. So there was 47% at the time. So you see basically, while still it's a third of companies that are saying this at this point, mm -hmm. it's lower than in 2016. And of course, you could argue whether the stakes are higher this, this time as they were in, in, in 2016. But the overall takeaway, though, from the survey, despite all these concerns, is that they still are optimistic for the 
the future, which I guess they have to be or they wouldn't have a job. But, but the idea, they do seem like, okay, look, we're still going to be here. We're still going to make money. We're still going to find a way to navigate. And they also talked about some of the big trends, AI and some of the other things that could, I guess, provide a tailwind, right? Yeah, the interesting thing is with regards to sort of optimism levels that basically sort of they haven't necessarily declined very much from the past quarter. Mm. So whilst we've seen um, consumer in, uh, in, uh, sentiment index and other indexes for consumers declining, you haven't seen the same amount of a decline for, for CFOs. So I think for, for many U.S. CFOs, um, things are still reasonably fine. Of course, there are things that they would like to be better. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, if you think about um, their forecast for GDP, it's a bit lower than what they said last year this time. So mm -hmm. we are seeing this, this slowing in the economy. But it's also they're not for forecasting in a recession, which is interesting. Given yeah. that, of course, a year ago, we were all talking about hard lending, soft lending, whatever lending. And, uh, and now we don't talk about it at all. Well, what we do talk about all the time is AI and automation and how that may end up uh, costing people some of their jobs. What are they saying about that? Yeah, that was um, interesting that there was basically sort of across the board um, open, openness towards um, using automation and uh, specifically artificial intelligence. So CFOs are saying that they want to invest in automation. Um, they say that they think that they can be better in terms of the product that they deliver, plus also then pricing. Um, interestingly enough, also a third of uh, respondents were saying that they see AI at some point substitution jobs, which of course is this big question as to, well, will AI make yeah. all of our jobs? jobs just better, or will it also result in some of us not having jobs anymore? I think I know the answer to that. But uh, it, it, when we get to the point, too, I mean, if all this does come to fruition with AI and stuff, they haven't been at all that vocal about whether that's going to replace jobs. I feel like a lot of the CFOs and CEOs, they kind of talk about automation AI, but they don't really come, say, okay, this is basically going to make things cheaper for us on the labor side. Yeah, many of them say that basically it will sort of free up people free from up. doing uh, right. tedious tasks and spreadsheets. Like having a job. Tedious tasks? Isn't, isn't that all of our jobs? All, all of our the job? things that sort of people <laughs> would agree with that probably they would love for an yeah. AI to do. But of course, at some point, sort of if you think about it from a, yeah. from a CFO perspective, labor is for many of them amongst the biggest cost yeah. items that they have. And so yeah. um, I would be surprised if we wouldn't see some right. sub substitution, as they said in the survey. All right, Nina. Well, you know what? If jobs weren't tedious, they would be hobbies. <laughs> Nina Trentman, <laughs> senior editor at Bloomberg and author of Bloomberg's new newsletter called CFO Briefing. All right, stick with us. We're going to set you up for what to watch over the next 24 hours. This is Bloomberg. All right, as we close out the day, let's look ahead the next 24 hours, some potential market moving events. And we're going to start before the bell here in the U.S. Earnings, Scarlett, never stops. CarMax. Uh, CarMax. It's another read on the retailer, uh, on the consumer, I should mm -hmm. say. And, of course, the latest data that we've been getting is that consumer spending is starting to really slow down. People are feeling the effects of all the price increases and of high borrowing costs. And we're mm -hmm. not spending the way that we used to. Yeah, particularly for big ticket items mm -hmm. like an automobile. If you need it, yeah, sure, you got to buy one. Yeah, but if you don't, with financing costs. And with financing costs high, uh, Definitely a big issue here. We'll keep an eye on that in the morning. We're also uh, going to get an update on PMIs, S&P Global U.S. Composite PMIs out in the morning. Yeah, we'll continue to take a look at that. We know the consumer side of the economy is starting to slow down. What does it look like on the manufacturing side? There's also leading indicators, which a lot of people crunch on their own because it's made mm -hmm. up of a bunch of different uh, yeah. indicators. And so sometimes this is, there's a lot of front running ahead of that. Mm -hmm. And then existing home sales. Affordability yeah. remains an issue. Absolutely here. And then at about 3.30 p.m. tomorrow, we're going to get more Fed speak. Hmm, I've been missing it. It yeah. comes again. <laughs> so you're not going to be tuning in for that. Uh, he, uh, uh, Fed, Fed President Tom Barkin uh, scheduled to talk about the, quote, recession are we question. talking about that? And really? That's in quotes, so I don't know what he's talking yeah. about, but I, I don't like see a recession here. Maybe he knows something we don't. We're also going to get that rebalancing uh, of the S&P, uh, which actually takes a place at the end of the day. Also, triple witching here, so maybe yes. so we could see some volatility into the close tomorrow. Scarlett and I will bring all that to you right here on Bloomberg. Thanks, guys.